Hi, I'm Kaisa Carlson, Deputy Editor at The Zine, and welcome to our talk about the role of art galleries in cities, which marks the launch of this new book, Amos Rex Art Museum, JKMM Architects. I'm joined today by writer, curator, and historian Lars Nitve, artist Carolina Helberg, and writer and head of creation at the Design Museum, Priya Kanchandani. Hi Lars, Carolina, and Priya. And welcome to this conversation today about art galleries in cities with Dizine. I'm hoping that you can start by uh, introducing yourselves. Um, perhaps last, you could start by telling us all, <laughs> telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, um, as you mentioned, I'm an art historian and, and curator. I've been uh, fortunate enough to run a number of major museums around the world. Uh, including Tate Modern, for example, in London, Louisiana Museum in Denmark, uh, M Plus in Hong Kong, which is due to open, Moderna Museum in Stockholm, etc. And I found myself being constantly involved in building projects. As a museum director, you're an art historian, but actually you tend to be building all the time. So it's from that vantage point, I think I'll participate in this discussion tonight. Wonderful. And you've also contributed to the book, so it'll be good to hear your points of views from your essay. I have indeed. <laughs> and Carolina, you're actually with us from Amos Rex at the moment, so you're in the very space that we'll be talking about. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and how come you're there. Hi, yes, of course. Good evening. So um, my name is Carolina Helberi uh, and I'm an artist uh, living and working in Helsinki. Um, and I'm part of uh, this new exhibition series that opened uh, in Amos Rex uh, two weeks ago, um, alongside with the main exhibition, um, a group exhibition that will have, uh, that has works both in this uh, space where I'm at the moment, so the Glass Palace uh, Biorex, and also downstairs in, a, in another uh, smaller museum hall. Great. Exciting to hear about it. Yeah, lovely to be um, with you. Thank you. And Priya, you're in London, like me, so we're both <laughs> hanging out outside of Scandinavia at the moment. And could you tell us a bit about yourself and your work for the Design Museum and just in general? Yeah, um, good to see you all. Thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm Priya Kanchandani. I'm head of curatorial at the Design Museum. Um, and my work has sort of stra <clears throat> straddled design and um, criticism and writing with curation. So. Um, I used to be the editor of Icon Magazine um, and I've worked in museums um, like the v &A, um, and uh, a year ago began working at the Design Museum where I oversee the, the curatorial department, the delivery of the exhibition programme and, and um, developing the forward programme. Uh, and it feels like a really exciting time to be talking about museums now that, you know, at least here in the UK, we're lucky to have just reopened last week. Um, so I'll, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk a bit about the role of the museum in the city now. Um, and I'm interested in, I think, the role of togetherness and how cultural institutions can bring people together again. That's wonderful. And yeah, like you said, it's only just recently that we here have been able to even go to museums. So looking forward to hearing what you guys at the Design Museum, what it feels like to be opened up again. It must be wonderful. <laughs> So uh, I know that you've all prepared presentations for this talk, and uh, I thought if we can start with Lars, if you can show us your presentation. Indeed. There we are. Um, and actually, we are in the wrong place with it. So I have to go <laughs> there. Sorry about that. Um, now, I, when I was thinking about um, Amos Rex, I thought about it's an incredibly memorable place. Those uh, of us who have been there, it's one of these sort of museum visits that you truly, truly remember. And at the same time, and if you see it from the city, when you approach it, it is an almost invisible museum. And in a way, I was thinking about this concept of the iconic museum that has been sort of plaguing us almost, I would say, at least from a curatorial point of view, for years since, I guess, uh, the uh, late 50s when we got the Guggenheim Museum and on, up, uh, on uh, the Upper East Side in on Manhattan, where you suddenly had this sort of building, this creature, which was a phenomenal sculpture in the city. But of course, something that you also, as an artist and as a curator, had to struggle with, 
continuously because you had sloping walls and sloping floors and and a circular space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Phenomenal and iconic in the cityscape for sure, but still quite a challenge from a curatorial and artistic point of view, I would say. Glorious, but mm, a bit problematic. And of course, this was followed up then by by the Guggenheim Bilbao because they had to follow up on the same tradition, I guess. And and again, you got this sort of glorious creature where everyone talks about then also the consequences of the Bilbao effect, something that every mayor in the world dreams of and they've never experienced it except in Bilbao, I think. But that's another story. But again, a space that has lots of weird space uh, or a building that had lots of weird spaces and may not be the best friend of the art necessarily. But uh, at the same time, a fantastic structure, of course. And even Helsinki has its own little version of it, which opened just uh, uh, in, the, in the form of Kiasma, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, which opened just a few months after Guggenheim Bilbao. And again, you get these sort of curved walls and sloping floors and, and, and so forth, which is pretty hard to handle perhaps from a curatorial point of view, or if you're an artist, you have to sort of adapt to the space instead of the building being a tool for, for, uh, for the artist, for the art and for the museum. Then I was thinking about, I mean, there are of course alternatives to the iconic or different types of iconic buildings. And this is actually the entrance, the very, very humble entrance to uh, the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art outside Copenhagen along the coast. And I was a director there some 20, 25 years ago, but still when I mentioned that to people around the world, when I meet them and they said, oh, I was there. It's my most memorable museum experience ever. It's a place I never forget. And I was thinking, this is a truly humble place, at least when you come from the outside. It's almost invisible besides this, the original villa through which you enter. It's an 1850s sort of country, small country house or hunting house, actually. Um, and of course, the experience then comes from the, the interior where, which you actually experience uh, driven by your own curiosity. You find spaces, you walk around and, and it's sort of almost invisible part, partially. You go in, you go out, you look out, you look in. And uh, it's also an architecture that is very much shaped by uh, the Danish lovely, of course, Danish 1950s, especially. It opened in 1958, at the same time, more or less, as a Guggenheim Museum in, on Manhattan. Uh, this is the view, of course. You can't see anything of this from the outside, but once you're inside, you get these fantastic vistas also. And I was thinking, is this maybe an early model for an alternative, another type of, of iconic building? And I was thinking of Amos Rex, because this is the exterior of Amos Rex, and it's the old 1936 building with an entrance uh, just here. This is the entrance where you, uh, if you see the cursor, uh, where you go into what used to be the entrance to the cinema that's still there, still there, and the restaurant upstairs. So it's a very intimate entrance. It's a very unassuming place in the center of the city. And once you come in there, you experience something else. I was just gonna show you some pictures from the 1930s when it was built, it looks the same. And on the back side of it, there was this bus uh, square or where the, the central station for the buses that went out into the periphery into the, 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 the periphery of Helsinki at the time. And that's really the only major change from that has happened where you see that something else is going on, that you see these sort of organic shapes cropping up from underneath as if there is a big animal under, under the underground in a way that wants to sort of come up and give you and ask maybe for your attention, but that's it. Otherwise, what you see is the same building that was there since 1936. But then, of course, when you go inside, 
you get these glorious spaces. Again, you're driven by your curiosity and you discover spaces. It's a little bit like the Louisiana, but of course in the, in the sort of 60 years later in a way with another sense of space and another, another type of experience. Uh, and it's a space that works for incredible immersive experiences, but also actually for classic painting exhibitions. And I should mention from this, uh, this picture, which is the last one I show, and which is uh, from the exhibition with a finished modernist billiard Karl Stett, that actually when you walk around in the space, you don't see the ceiling in the same way as you see here. It's a glorious vaulted ceiling that is quite spectacular if it was lit. But actually once you're in the space, you don't really think of it and, or think about it. And uh, it's only in the photographs that you get it because you have a different perspective in the 35 millimeter lens than you have in your eyes. But that's, uh, I think that it's a really a model for another type of iconic building where the iconic sits in the experience, in the discovery and in curiosity. Thank you, Lars, that's really, really interesting. And I think one of the things that really struck me with your presentation was that you were talking about the Kiasma, which is a, a brand new building, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, obviously they can be potentially slightly cold, even though they're adjusted for the art. Whereas you seem to be saying that Luciana and Amos Rex, which were both kind of older buildings that have been adapted to become art spaces, that they can potentially feel more welcoming to visitors. I think it's uh, maybe it's more about, uh, I don't think it's about history or the present because I definitely mm -hmm. think you can build a new built museum, totally new built where every brick is, is, is sort of there in place from the, for the first time in, in, in our year. Um, and it can be welcoming to the art. I think it's more what, what the, I guess both the clients and the architects, how they think about the role of the museum. And I think the key thing always is to think of the museum as a tool for an experience, for the meeting between the art and the public. And it should sort of accommodate two audiences in a way, the, the artists, the artworks and the public. And I think that some of these sort of spectacular, iconic buildings actually are more thinking about something else, about uh, uh, making the mayor in the city happy or attend, uh, drawing audiences for the spectacle in the city, rather than actually being tools for an art experience. And actually, I think the main problem is not cold or not cold, but more uh, perhaps that, you know, most artists actually have an idea of a space and usually that space is relatively close to their studio space when they create the works of art. And they usually their studios don't have sloping floors or tilting walls or things like that. They are pretty much 90 degree angles, relatively square, if you like. And I think that you have to sort of provide these kind of spaces primarily, but not necessarily only. And then it can be a spectacular building in many other ways. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting though. So you're basically saying that the museums almost have to think about the artists' uh, surroundings, like when the works were created, to be able to display them in a way that really enhances the art, I suppose. Yeah, I think, and I think this was a starting point actually for, for example, Tate Modern to, to a large extent. Uh, actually, one of the arguments for actually using, reusing an existing building was a gallop that was made among a large number of artists of their favorite types of exhibition spaces. And they came up with the idea of, 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 of actually a reused or, uh, alter, uh, or an, an alternative use for industrial buildings. Often, of course, because artists actually were working in these types of spaces themselves. They had them as their studios, wherever they worked in abandoned industrial buildings, uh, be yeah, it I mean... in New York or in Stockholm or in London. Yeah, especially, I suppose, London in the 1990s when you were at Tate in uh, 98, I believe. So it would yeah. have been very much a time when people have been working in these old industrial buildings before perhaps London turned them into flats. <laughs> exactly. 
I, uh, I want to move on to Carolina, who is actually in Almost Rex at the moment and who's very well placed to talk to us about what artists think about when they create the works. Could you tell us a little bit about your process and, uh, well, actually, sorry, do start with sharing your presentation before I Thank jump you. on you with loads of questions. <laughs> no, but uh, during the presentation, I would also talk about that theme. So that's, um, that's a wonderful um, direction. So just a second. So great. So yes. And thank you, Mr. Nitve, for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, and good evening to everyone. Um, and um, as Kaisa said, um, uh, greetings uh, from Helsinki and from the Glass Palace, from the uh, Biorex um, lobby, where I'm currently sitting um, uh, in an exhibition that I'm part of called Between Us. Um, and before I start uh, more about uh, telling about um, this process and this specific exhibition and project, I'd like to congratulate everyone, all the parties that were, that are um, uh, involved uh, making this wonderful book that I also got a chance to read the uh, exquisite texts and uh, see the images. So it's really wonderful. Um, so thank you so much about that. Uh, so my role and perspective for this talk uh, and presentation is uh, of an artist who among two other artists, uh, Tero Guitunen uh, and Raimo Saarinen, both in the picture, uh, Raimo is in the middle, Tero is on the left, um, were invited by the museum to launch this new exhibition series uh, called Studio Rex um, uh, for the new uh, Amos Rex Museum. We were invited uh, first in uh, 2019 and our exhibition was supposed to take place in, uh, well, 2020, uh, but it opened two weeks ago and I think we all uh, know why, but uh, so we've had a very, um, uh, very interesting and, and lovely and, and rather long um, uh, collaboration and interaction with the museum. Um, and we're happy, so happy to have uh, now had the chance to open the exhibition. So the, uh, the idea of this new exhibition series uh, that's called Studio Rex um, is basically to, um, uh, well, there's two core ideas uh, from the museum, if I've understood correctly, is kind of um, as, um, in a way to have a series of uh, exhibitions that will um, be simultaneous with the big uh, big main exhibitions uh, and that program, but also in a way kind of fill in the gaps uh, in a way because the museum is, is often relatively long from the public uh, uh, eye um, or in, from their experience when they're installing the new exhibitions or when they're dismantling it. So to have an exhibition that's that's on during those time and also during simultaneously as, as the main exhibition as it happens to be now with us uh, and uh, the exhibition Blick by Kaya Sarja on Raya Malka. Um, and also the idea to, um, to activate and to use these, these other spaces of the museum, um, of this Almos Rex um, new museum uh, that are outside the big uh, exhibition hall. So for example, this um, wonderful uh, Biorex foyer and uh, even, even the, could be the plaza, could be like some other rooms of the museum. Um, uh, so, so also to make the public aware uh, what other spaces are belonging to the active museum um, ensemble and also to give uh, artists these new inspiring um, uh, possibilities um, and inspirations. So, um, so we were uh, invited and uh, trusted with this uh, to be the first one to have this kind of a carte blanche to create these site-specific works to, as I said, uh, these not yet used in an art context spaces of the museum, um, uh, among which we chose to make works for this smaller uh, dome uh, hall downstairs next to the big hall. And, um, and this space has previously been planned and used for um, events and pedagogical purposes. Uh, and then how could we not resist this uh, amazing and charismatic Biorex space? Um, uh, and it's actually a place where, uh, where currently I'm now sitting, but I have lots of uh, kind of nostalgic memories from like childhood, like coming to see films and, and teenage years. So it's a very kind of um, 
I think it's been it's been present in quite many uh, people living in Helsinki or like in its surroundings for for of course a long time since the 30s. But uh, but for me also it's been quite um, nostalgic to to work specifically in this space. Um, and with uh, Tero and Raimo, uh, we really love the kind of the why we chose these two spaces out of all the uh, the possibilities that we really like the duality and the dialogue that these two quite. Um, different like spaces, the new underground premises, and now this um, very historical uh, mm, filled with stories kind of like uh, space could um, create and kind of have this conversation within each other. Um, and um, there's not much time for me to show the whole exhibition we made, but I'd like to share images of all of our um, works and installations, how they look in the spaces. So, um, I'll start uh, with uh, with downstairs. So now we are there uh, underground in the smaller dome hall, um, and uh, we can see the the view to this wall uh, where where there is my uh, installation called Offerings, uh, consisting of paintings on canvas, these lithographic prints, uh, three dimensional still lifes, and a bench in front of it. And there's also uh, Raimos sculpture in front of it that I have a better image coming up later. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, an installation by artist Tero Kuitunen. It's called In Between. Um, still, they're in the same space downstairs. Uh, it's kind of like works, uh, it's kind of like upside down universe, uh, kind of spreading like a virus, uh, if I may say. And it's an allusion to, um, to the, to, to the world of Biorex here upstairs. It uses the same typographic elements as uh, were created for, uh, for the cinema and for the lobby in the 30s. And uh, he, he made them in ceramics and distorted them, added them a twist and uh, using also the, um, um, the shape and the material of the, uh, the museum um, wooden floor. Mm. And here we see a better picture of Raimos uh, uh, sculpture mobile. If I say mobile, um, the short version of the name is it started as a molten mass. It goes on. You can check it online <laughs> if you want to hear it, uh, the whole. Um, and it's made in paper and these plant based paints. Um, and it, uh, thinking about also the architectural side of that space, it kind of beautifully evokes what that specific spot was before. So um, it had to be taken, like so much stones has to be dug uh, out from that uh, space in order to make this uh, subterranean or underground museum space. So these are in a way like uh, ghosts of those uh, stones that used to be in, in that specific place. And we see a little bit of that um, wonderful uh, window going, um, connecting the plaza and the, the underground museum and giving natural light inside. Um, and this is uh, from uh, the, the Biorex Terrace. Um, this is uh, another piece by Raimo and it's called the, uh, the Garden of the Apocalypse. And this is constantly changing and living installation uh, uh, with flowers, with with the living trees um, in a very urban spot in Helsinki, as we've uh, already like understood there, we see actually Kiasma in, uh, uh, under construction and there's a parliament on the other side. And um, uh, so, and uh, it adds a wonderful contrast. And this is uh, like a close up detail of it. Um, uh, and you can actually see that, well, you can maybe understand, but you can see the, uh, the wonderful installation also from the street level. And there's this flow flowing fountain uh, on this industrial construction. And uh, now actually these pictures were taken about uh, just before our opening about two weeks ago, but now they're, the trees are blooming, they're having their first leaves and the flowers uh, on the containers are just um, getting wild. So it's, it's really amazing. And this is Teros um, uh, installation here in the Biorex that I can see when I just like now look uh, forward um, called Artifacts of Disharmony, um, evoking the pillars that are holding up this functionalistic building, uh, taking the same like color schemes that are existing in the space. And he created these handmade unique um, 
artifacts, these um, sculptures on top of them, um, commenting on this this day and uh, this phenomenon, but also it's kind of way of some museums and quite many like showing showing things, uh, valuable objects on these pedestals and playing with the um, architecture and the proportions of the room. And to end, uh, now is actually we're seeing an image of what you can maybe see a little bit from behind me. Uh, these uh, two um, uh, constructions with uh, um, big framed paintings on this Tulevia Ensilda Commande Premiere, which means upcoming um, uh, premieres, uh, the, the old movie premieres of the space. And there I've created this um, kind of a all time um, movie poster themed or like um, paintings that are connected to a smaller video that is uh, on display on the on the top of the little stairs you can see on the side. But yes, yeah, thank you for the time and uh, looking forward to yeah continue the conversation and everyone wishing everyone a warm welcome to come and see the exhibition in Helsinki if there is a possibility we really hope that there will be. Thank you, Carolina. And uh, I'm so happy that you're actually in Almost Rex at the moment because it, exactly. it does feel like we kind of get to be there a little bit. It's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, I found it so interesting that with this exhibition, you got to create works for both the upstairs, which is the original 1930s building mm. and downstairs, which is the new extension. And you were saying you did lithographies for the downstairs. Exactly, uh, yes. Is that correct? So did that influence yes. it when you created the artworks, when you knew that some of the uh, artworks would be upstairs and some of them would be downstairs? Definitely, yes, it did. Uh, it was actually quite nice when the three of us, when we first, we had the first meetings with the museum um, and we were so excited and we were going through these different spaces and uh, going downstairs, we kind of all... Uh, we've done one exhibition together uh, previously and so we know each other really well and we're good friends but we kind of uh, for example in that specific downstairs we we immediately knew in which spot we're going to, which we'd like to kind of in a way have and where we'd like to create our installations and having quite like uh, strong ideas right afterwards we went for a lunch and we were all I, I could say also speaking for the other artists as well very inspired of the uh, kind of the the whole atmosphere of being underground, we all kind of treated the, the theme very differently, uh, but there are still very obvious connections as well, but uh, very much. And this, for me, was this idea of archaeology and uh, also in the way of this going to different dimensions and you have all these mythologies of going under underneath the ground and all this. So very much it did influence. And also here upstairs, I would say that uh, the whole, well, for me, the, the presence of the movies and uh, that, that was really a guiding line for the works. Yeah. And it must be, I mean, extra exciting if you've grown up with the building and uh, as someone who kind of knew the Lassi Palazzi when it wasn't an art museum. Exactly. How yeah. do you feel about it today? Like what's it brought to the city of Helsinki that it's now an art gallery as well as this kind of social and cinema space? I think it works really wonderfully. Um, I mean, there is, it has this kind of, uh, this, this Lassi Palazzi, it has all these layers of history, it has its very own character and presence and, uh, of course, the location in the city, but it like very kind of gently and, and organically has transformed into these new functions, but also keeping some of the, uh, the original ones, uh, and very kind of like, yeah, organically merged together. And Biorex is all still uh, working movie theater and uh, kind of very flexible. And it looks the same, but it might feel slightly different. I think it's really successful. That's so great. Yeah, I really hope to come back and see it soon because I, I really enjoy the one visit I, <laughs> I had to it. That's so nice to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolina. I'm going to move on to Priya, who's uh, the curatorial director for another amazing art gallery, the Design Museum. Well, art gallery, but uh, <laughs> London's Design Museum. And if you could show us your presentation and please tell us what it's like to be open again. I mean, it's great, isn't it? I, a, to be open as an institution, but to also see other institutions open and to just be able to go and see other exhibitions in person as a source of inspiration. And I think it's, you know, I mean, the, the heart and soul of London feels like it's coming back to life. I don't know how you guys feel. Um, 
but I mean, every city in the world, and I'm sure there's people here um, tuned in from lots of different places, is at a different stage. Um, so for those in slightly darker places, we've been there and, you know, we'll, we'll all get there in the end. But on that note, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering what to talk about today because I haven't had the pleasure of going to Amos Rex, um, although I was curious to hear more about it. So I'm really grateful to um, Lars and Carolina for the presentations. Um, something I've been thinking about a lot recently is how cultural institutions bring people together. Um, and that's been triggered by a number of things. One is the fact that the physical building has been closed and has forced us to reflect on um, how we bring people together outside of the physical space, um, but also the importance and value of the physical space, I think has a renewed importance. Um, we've also been in you know, the year of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think in terms of uh, cultural division, we're at a really divisive moment. Um, and I think that has made me reflect on the role of cultural institutions on bringing people together. So that's something I just wanted to think about today. So this is the Design Museum well before the pandemic, um, when I was fortunate to be able to chair this discussion sitting on the steps um, with you know, hundreds of people in the atrium. This is the John Pawson um, redesign of what was originally um, the Commonwealth Institute. Um, on High Street Kensington in London. Um, as you can see, it's full of energy. Um, it was, you know, incredible eat night involved sort of bumping into people, involved discussion, um, people asking questions in real life, which um, unfortunately we're still not able to do today. Um, but I just wanted to start with this image because I feel like it just has a different resonance now um, to how it did perhaps a year ago. Um, luckily, you know, as I said, we've been able to reopen the museum, but under new terms. Um, and I think the sort of rigid rigidity of the idea of the display as a concept really encapsulates that. The, you know, we're now, like these objects, forced to interact with the museum within certain boundaries, limited visitor numbers, certain uh, ideas of flow and space that are very different from before. And we're having to redefine the notion of touch, which, you know, is an important part of um, the encounter with the object in certain instances where it's allowed, but we've had to sort of revisit um, lots of things and think again about how we bring people together. Um, but I think the idea of the sneaker, which is a subject of our gallery show we opened last week, sort of brings people together in a different way. Um, the sneaker as an object that we all identify with across cultures and geographies, and that's something that the narrative of the exhibition uh, devised by my colleague Ligaya Salazar, the curator, I think really successfully does um, at a really important time in which to kind of reflect on the idea of otherness and how it feeds into design history. And for joining the Design Museum, um, I worked across cultural institutions and design journalism. Um, I was the editor of Icon magazine, where I introduced a sort of thematic approach which covered many different subjects ranging from the circular economy to decolonizing design um, and a couple of special issues about London, which made me think about the relationship between the city and, and culture. Um, London in particular is a city where culture has thrived historically, but because of restrictions such as the price of housing, um, you know, the space for culture has been shrinking and it's made me ask, you know, how can um, cities enable culture to thrive and how can um, culture institutions play a role in that. Now I've been lucky to I guess visit a lot of arts institutions all over the world um, partly in, through work and I wanted to just go through a couple that st stuck in my mind that I think have tackled the idea of togetherness in different and interesting ways. This is Charles Correa's British Council in New Delhi where I was posted for a year when I used to work at the British Council. Within this building is a courtyard called the Char Bagh, which is a really interesting site for togetherness. It's an outdoor space and we use it for, for gatherings, but also to commission theatre, outdoor performances, and even outdoor installations. Um, it showed me the power of sort of architecture that's tuned to its climate and context, which Korea's architecture notoriously was. Um, this sort of vernacular um, Indian modernism that he coined um, 
you know, may, I think makes a real difference to how people can come together in this climate, which I found interesting. This is a very, very different uh, space. This is um, uh, a stairwell from the Bauhaus Museum in Weimar um, by the German architect uh, Heike Hanada, which I um, reviewed when it first opened. Um, I'd probably describe it as a relatively severe building. In some ways, you could call it the antithesis of togetherness in this sort of monolithic cuboid form, um, which the, with this sort of staircase that slices through the building um, in quite a vertiginous and quite an extreme way. But I think that it kind of shows a different kind of togetherness, which is about the, the kind of telling a story of Germany by bringing together the past and present. Um, you know, Germany has obviously quite a fractured history. Um, and I think this stairwell really epitomizes that um, in a harsh but necessary way. Um, in, at the upper landing, there's a window that actually looks out onto a memorial by Fritz Kramer that marks one of Germany's largest concentration camps. So I think it's just an example of how architecture of the cultural institution can bring together different histories and stories. Uh, another very different example, I mean, I was lucky to, to get the chance to go to Seoul in uh, 2017 for the first Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism, which took place at, in this building, the Dong Domin Design Plaza by Zaha Hadid, completed in 2014, which is this sort of, you know, very um, uh, engulfing, I suppose, giant UFO-like building. It has these sort of sinuous curves and um, these flashing lights. Um, it has quite an imposing form. Um, and it's interesting, Lars used the word icon, and this might be a building that fits within more of that kind of category. And I think it's sort of, it, it, you know, it's a vast space. Um, it's very malleable on the inside, but it kind of asks the question of um, the role of the culture institution versus the content. Um, and I think that's a debate that has constantly been had, you know, from Leedskin to, you know, different in different uh, contexts and discourses, which is very interesting. But I think the outdoor space is, um, was a very live, a live space for use for um, public gatherings, um, for pop-ups and, and um, all sorts of activity, which I found um, really interesting and I think really added character. I mean, I've also been fortunate to see a lot of sites of culture um, other than the museum which I think are worth touching on. Um, so I went to review Jerusalem Design Week, um, the Milan Triennale, curated by Paola Antonelli, Sharjah Architecture Triennale. Um, so I developed a sort of strong grounding in how uh, ideas about design and art are communicated through museums, but also beyond. And I think as museums, we have a lot to learn from, I think the agility of the way creativity is exhibited in those sorts of forums. Um, and I had a chance to curate a couple of Biennales, which was a really interesting experience, um, including Lisbon and London Design Biennale. Um, and I think um, keeping a dialogue between the formal and informal structures of culture is really important. Um, I mean, I also wanted to talk about other spaces that we maybe don't acknowledge as formal um, spaces of culture, cultural exhibition, but actually they have a really important role to play um, in how the museums of the future, I think, might um, recognize culture. So this is um, an image from Burning Man, one of the um, installations rising from the desert sand, which I thought was, you know, shows the sort of the architecture of culture in a different way. Um, this is a feature I commissioned about club washing. It's about developers using temporary super clubs to boost the potential for regeneration of an area but in the meantime, sort of creating a, form, a sort of subculture or space for subculture. And then finally, since we're in the year of the pandemic and you know we're having a digital talk after all, I wanted to touch on the idea of the intangible archive, the intangible museum, um, because I think it'll have increased growing role to play. This is the Uncensored Library, which we featured in uh, the Design Museum Designs of the Year. Um, it's an open source library that, that exists within the computer game Minecraft and it contains journals, articles that are banned in numerous countries like China where the media is controlled. Um, and the, the library, can, you can log on and it's filled with books containing articles that were censored in their country of origin um, and they're now you know, hidden from government surveil surveillance through this really clever structure. So I, I, I felt that that was, you know, if we're talking about the different structures in which museums and culture exist, um, I thought that might be an interesting one to end on. 
Um, but overall, I, I think, you know, we're at such a crucial moment in terms of how we form culture. You know, the status quo has never been in greater flux, certainly during my career, the politic, our politics are in chaos. Um, I think it'd be interesting to, and I'd love to hear views of Lars and Carolina about how, I guess, cultural institutions can um, bring us together to create togetherness in different ways. Thank you so much, Priya. That was amazing. And I want to go to all those places and <laughs> I want to come back to the design museum soon as well. Um, a thing that really struck me was when you talked about this idea of togetherness, uh, in terms of museums and creating shows and working in galleries, we haven't been able to do that. You haven't been able to do that for a year. So how did the design museum kind of create this togetherness without a physical space? Is it even possible? Yeah, I mean, it's really challenging. I think there was a moment where there was a discussion about, you know, the role of the museum and whether the physical is a necessary experience um, because I think online uh, events were so successful and we filmed digital tours of our exhibitions, which were very popular, um, which, for example, electronic music. Um, and through those, we were able to include the kind of voice of the creator and the narrative of the exhibition talk through key objects, but we were also able to include the voices of experts and designers who were featured in the exhibition. So it was very interesting to sort of, yeah, extrapolate from the idea of the, the physicality of the exhibition into the sort of more intangible experience of encountering it on screen. And it was, it in many ways went well. Um, and I remember being um, on a workshop with Sam Jacob, Desktop Design Academy that we did um, during, in the height of the pandemic. And um, we asked people to come and present the idea of the Museum of the Future. And one proposition was a building that was entirely empty and it would be a space for social, social gathering um, while the archive was um, to be encountered digitally. So I think this was the, the extreme uh, proposition of a museum without the museum. But I found that a rather dystopian proposition and I still feel, yeah, there's definitely I think, you know, and now another year on from that, I think that we've come to value the, the real, the tangible, the physical experience of encountering culture um, so much more perhaps than ever. So um, I, I'm inclined to think or hope that that proposition wouldn't be put on the table now. Do you think it might also change the way that a museum display things? I know at the Design Museum, you turned your museum shop into a kind of shoppable art event. Do you think that might be, might museum use spaces that aren't normally used? And might we also see more outdoor exhibitions or more kind of indoor outside exhibitions as we kind of slowly start to come back to normal? I mean, I'm sure in certain geographies, the concept of the outdoor is very attractive. I, I mean, mm. those who, who know the UK um, will know that that's um, slightly less practical here. And um, I think, you know, we are planning um, a full programme for the next couple of years. We've got a full programme in place of exhibitions in our gallery spaces. Um, we're really excited to have opened Sneakers. We're opening Charlotte Perriot in June. Um, and we've got Waste Age opening in the autumn. Um, so we've got loads in the running. I think, you know, we're quite optimistic um, that museums will be able to continue offering like this, operating like this. But um, have we changed? Yes, of course we have. I think we'll be working more digitally. We'll be talking to collaborators internationally more because we're able to do that. Um, I think we have to revisit uh, the role of touch um, in exhibition spaces. Um, but yeah, the, in terms of the supermarket, just to tell those watching who don't know about it, it was a pop-up where we turned the shop um, into a site for um, art designers essentially to create packaging for essential goods um, at a time when museums were not legally allowed to open, but retail was. So we sort of, it was created in quite a reactive, we had to create it in quite a reactive way. And it was in response yeah, to the pandemic and the decisions regarding the milestones that had been made by the government at that time that meant that we still had to have our doors shut. And it was hugely popular. You know, we had queues down the road and mm -hmm. everything sold out. And so I definitely think it's made us see that, you know, we can be more agile and there are different ways to, for us to share ideas with our audiences. That's wonderful. And I mean, shows what an appetite there was for people to come and see something physical and to see art in, in real life. 
I'm uh, going to sort of open up the floor to more kind of general discussion now. And uh, the first talking point that we have is what type of urban landmark should a museum be in the 21st century? Just start off slow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I can say something. Uh, the question is if you can ask the museum to be an urban landmark, because at the end, especially if you talk about uh, an art museum, there are some differences. If you're a design museum, the most, not all, but most, a lot of design happens without even any thought of the museum. It's, it happens because we need sneakers or we need something else. Uh, while art happens in order to be shown and seen by others. And of course, artists, they choose whatever, whether it's uh, meant to be seen indoors or outdoors, as we talked about, digitally or physically and so forth. I mean, it's their choice. And for the museum, I think its role is really to follow the lead of the artists and to be good dancers in a way. And I think that actually the buildings or I think more and more we have to think that a muse uh, the museum, you shouldn't confuse the museum with a building. You actually, the museum is a content in a way and its relationships to its audiences. And the building is one of these platforms where you can have that relationship. So it's sort of tough to ask the museum to be uh, that type of, of landmark or, or play a particular role in the city. If that comes out naturally, as a result of what art uh, artists are doing and the the way the best way to present works, then absolutely fine. And of course, I love the idea of the social meeting place, and I think museums should be social. But that's another uh, question, so I shouldn't dwell too long on that. But we can come, come back to it, perhaps. Ian, Carolina, do you have any thoughts on the idea of the museum as an urban landmark? Yes, I, I have to say that I very much agree on the points that Lars just shared and pointed out. I was thinking that maybe a, um, exactly if, if, if a museum um, works in a dialogue with the artists and vice versa and the viewers and, uh, and the residents or the visitors, I mean, it will, uh, and, and that dialogue and kind of collaboration works well, then I think it will become uh, an urban landmark. <laughs> so, so I don't think that uh, that's something that, yes, as I think Lars said, that will come as a result, but uh, in a way um, it would sound like a lot of pressure for the museum to become like, you have to like to, to start it from, from that base that a good museum should be that. And what does it mean? But it's a very interesting concept and, and uh, like a discussion, like what is an urban landmark? Like there, there can be many possibilities than the first idea that comes to your mind. Uh, but I would say that uh, if thinking about like something that is, um, in an urban setting, a landmark something that is important for the people who like noticed and a uh, landmark is something that you see and you kind of uh, go around and you go and you're kind of taken by the people. Um, I think that's something that's of course wonderful for people, uh, for a museum to happen, but it's something, uh, yeah, that happens through the, through the work and the communication. <laughs> Riyad, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's an interesting term, urban landmark, and it's just made me think, what does that mean? Um, I do think the construct of the museum was designed to be a sort of urban landmark in the sense it had a role in placemaking. So the 19th century museum created by Henry Cole, for example, in South Kensington, it was supposed to be a, a way to, to establish this as Al Albertopolis as being an area that, that didn't previously exist. Previously exist. So I think inherently the idea of the museum itself is rooted in that purpose on some level. Um, but I think that the idea of urban landmark, I don't know, I guess that there's, there could, you know, there has been a tendency, if you know, the architecture of the, of the uh, museum to dominate. Um, and I think the idea of icon, the, that term that Lars used is really appropriate. You know, there's a debate as to what the role of the museum is in that sense, the ar architecture versus the, the kind of purpose of the museum. But so I definitely think, yeah, although it has a role in placemaking, there, there kind of needs to be a balance. Um, I think the best sort of cultural architecture, you know, if you look at like the work of Jamie Fobert, for example, is where the architecture isn't always trying to make a really overt statement. 
um, or assert itself, but it's just still then it's just to have that quite subtle poetic quality that allows it to be a forum to display ideas that don't canvas as well. But I, I mean, I do, I do think that that the way, and this is following up on what Carolina was saying, I think is that a museum becomes an urban landmark probably in in a particular way, depending on how you use the word landmark, which is, I think that needs to be put within brackets, I think. But by becoming a place where people feel that they have the right to be and they have the right to congregate and they feel that it's for them and not just for the others. And I mean, I think that this is what happened in a way with Tate Modern. You know, I mean, no one thought at the time we were planning Tate Modern that the numbers of people would go there and actually the, the, the groups of people that came there had never been to museums to a large extent before. I mean, it was a totally different uh, mix, of, mix of, of visitors or users of the museum in a way. And, and it, you know, if you listen to the consultants in 1998, um, 99, about the numbers we would see, it, would, it was roughly a quarter of actually what has been coming regularly for the last 20 years. And I think that the reason for that was that people felt that they actually had the right to be there. It was a place where they were welcome and, you know, it was not excluding in a very, very fundamental way. And I mean, that does it, it, it may not, and, and, you know, it may not have to do with the content actually. It may, it had to do what, how it felt to be there, to come there, to be received there. It had to do with how staff were dressed and the fact that it always opened a little bit before the official opening hour, not after, and things like that, that actually made it feel like, you know, welcoming, simply. Mm -hmm. I think that made it a landmark, not necessarily that was housed in a, in a big brick building uh, mm. uh, by the Thames. That was actually another thing that I wanted us to talk about, like how museums should connect with residents of the city and your point about it, is museums being welcoming? Is that the most important trademark? You know, I mean, with the risk of sounding like an old minister of culture, I would say, I mean, a museum is about excellence and access. I think Chris Smith, uh, the old Minister of Culture, used that uh, 20 years ago as a mantra. And I think because you, on one hand, you are there for the content, for the art and the artist, if it's an art museum, and you should be totally uncompromising. But at the same time, besides that, you should make it just as welcoming as ever possible. And your role is to create, to optimize that meeting between sometimes very strange stuff and someone who comes in from the street and maybe who are not maybe even used to seeing that kind of material before and, and to optimize that. And I think it is, it is about being in a certain way welcoming. And, and, you know, I think the intimacy of the entrance of the Amos Rex, for example, plays a role in that. It's not pompous. So you just sort of, you just open a relatively small door and you can sort of just sneak in in a way it's not a big deal because you pass on the sidewalk and you sneak in there and then you have this adventure and mm. and i think that these things these small gestures are quite important carolina exactly i i do i do agree on that as well and also the idea of welcome it brings me an idea that yes you welcome a resident and a person once but you kind of the museum can form a long relationship with one person, you know, like a museum is a place where people go in very different moments of their lives and days or context. You might like, I think I, I find it charming, the idea that a museum is like ideally, of course, there's different types of like museums, there's always exceptions, but in general, um, I find the idea nice that you can go there with your, with your family, you can go there alone, you can go there a date, you can go just to find sanctuary, you can go to seek inspiration, you can just or go for a specific, like, so that it, uh, in kind of all your life, uh, if the museum is open <laughs> all your life, so <laughs> just like to build <laughs> like these longer relationships and like very um, kind of versatile and like it kind of grows as a, again, like organically as a, as a plant, you might want to take a friend there or like uh, show, oh, you know, I had this amazing experience, I want to share it, go there many times. Hmm. I think to me, it's important how you 
actually, and I think it reflects a lot how you talk about your visitors, your mm. guests, your the users of the museum. I mean, what I mean, a visitor is one thing; it's a more distant way. At the Louisiana Museum, interestingly enough, the word for the visitors was always guests, mm. which meant a, sort of a welcoming ambiance. I've always liked, uh, especially for those who are the repeat. Uh, repeat visitors who come through their life. I mean, if they could move from being visitors to actually people who use the museum. Users have many meanings as a word, of course, but but in this case, actually, who use the use the museum, make it a part, an important part of their life. That can be mm. your core audience, of course. So I think these things are actually quite important, how it, and actually could be reflected in the buildings. Mm. Well, that's actually interesting. When uh, when Priya was showing her presentation, so many of the buildings were so striking. And uh, does that bring something to the art? Is it is it a bonus if the artist is in an incredible building? Uh, Priya, do you remember those museums especially well because the buildings were so stunning? Or I mean, as a, I was as an architecture critic, I was obviously <laughs> at my eye on the architecture. Um, you know, I do, but I, but I think a, you know a successful museum is able to. I guess where the, where it's where the objects and the architecture can work in harmony um, and that's partly facilitated by the architecture itself but I think as you you know were just saying Lars it's also about the atmosphere of the museum and that's generated through lots of different factors it's yeah to do with how are you welcomed when you arrive at the door like what you know what is the, what is what is the exhibition and do you relate to that how do you identify with it um, I think you know one of the challenges for museums going forward is about you know diversifying their audiences and so on so it'll be about how you know a young person um when they arrive at a museum what can they get here that they they're not going to get on instagram um you know what how what is it about the experience of being in a museum it's not just seeing the object but the experience the feeling of being there um, and i think that's something you know, successful museums have thought about a lot, you know, and like you were saying, Tate Modern is such an incredible example of that. I think it's the most popular attraction of the UK, which is astounding that it's a museum, you know, but on the flip side, I guess it's attracting diverse audiences. It's a challenge for lots of museums. Um, and, you know, historically museums have been sort of seen as a place, place of privilege. Yeah. Um, and some museums have managed to break that barrier, but it's still the minority. So I think that's where we really have to think about what are the stories we're telling, um, who can relate to them, and how do we make sure that they're as inclusive as possible? No, no doubt. But I mean, just to underline, I'm not, I'm not arguing for uh, that. I, I'm not saying that the quality of architecture or good architecture doesn't matter i mean i think it really matters and i've been fortunate enough to work with great great architects all the way through in every museum i work and of course the louisiana museum is a fantastic gem and the m plus which is soon opening now in the fall is a is a fantastic building but it's been designed with all these aspects in mind thinking about the the audience thinking about lowering the threshold thinking about the artist and the artwork and it's not primarily been the driver hasn't been to create an icon in the city i think that's my my point no that's, but i to yeah. i totally agree with, uh, with priya and, and your your views on on what the museum should be doing and what's important on the agenda now and Carolina, from the artist's point of view, does it make a difference to you? What kind of building your, your art will be shown in? Is it exciting to show in a, in a brand new gallery or are you just happy that people get to see the art regardless of where it is? Um, well, I think there is, um, well, if I could answer like uh, yes to the both. I mean, like, of course, I think the, uh, the structure of the, 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 the room or the building or the premises, they do, um, they do play a role. It depends, of course, also in the process. Are you creating more like site-specific works to a specific place? Are you um, usually artists, if, if they know that they would have an exhibition coming up, even though they wouldn't be site-specific, like you would think about, you would have the space in your mind in somehow, but then there are different types of projects. But uh, 
but then um, you can be, like be flexible different types of spaces they off at least that's what I think they're um so I'm giving kind of a, like a broad answer to that but uh <laughs> um yes and and yes but then there's so many different types of artists I mean some are more kind of willing to show in in, in different and some are more more precise so so uh, we're um uh, mixed free <laughs> like we're different <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad to say that that's actually all we've got time for today, unfortunately. And uh, before we go, we're mm. going to share a short film by Tapio Snellman about the museum, just to round off the talk. Um, but before we start that, I want to thank Lars, Priya and Carolina so much for joining us. And I kind of wish we had like another hour to talk about this. Thank you. But... And thank, thank you. For coming today. And thank you for all good questions. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.